Good evening all, and welcome. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you who commented and liked and interacted in the last video I released. Your support really meant a lot, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Lastly, today, well, because it's 1am now, or tomorrow if you're in the States, is my wife's birthday, the 15th of January. So, if you could, and you'd like to, feel free to wish her a happy birthday. I'm sure that she'll be very pleasantly surprised in tomorrow morning's comment section. Don't worry, I'm gonna take her somewhere nice. But anyway, for now guys, I hope you're ready. And be warned, some of these stories are very disturbing. So proceed with caution. It's time to let the darkness take control. Before I begin, I think it's important to give you a little bit of background. I am currently 20 years old, but when these events occurred, I was between 15 and 17. I had never downloaded Tor and used basic software as I'm not very tech savvy nor did I really believe in the hype of the deep web. I never found a red room, nor convincing murders. But I do have some messed up stories. One in particular, revolving around airplane crashes. This site had hundreds of black box recordings, and you could listen to them uncensored. They contained recordings of everything from plane crashes to hijackings. I'm a morbid person, so naturally I listened to a few of them. If you have a weak stomach, I don't suggest ever seeking out this site. You could hear people crying, praying, screaming, in addition to the sounds of crashes and the impacts and gunshots. The worst was a pilot speaking to what sounded like himself during what he communicated to be total engine failure. He was the pilot of a passenger plane, carrying four families out of China. There are small descriptions of the planes and pilots, and what happened under each audio file. In it, you could hear him praying, the controls making frantic sounds, and his frantic, panicked voice slowly receded to a ghost relative of acceptance. I will never forget the absolute fear in his voice, while he spoke what I assume was Chinese, and I couldn't make a sense of his words. His tone told me exactly what he was doing. The movies don't give an accurate description of fear. They don't convey the helplessness of a human trapped in a flying tin can in the sky as it falls back to land. I felt as if I was with him. As I heard the plane make impact, I witnessed his final moments through my headphones, and I heard the moment that little black box stopped recording. The description said the plane that crashed held no survivors, and there were over 40 small children on board. I don't know the details of what happened, since the site was just brief descriptions and audio files, but the voices I heard were real people, and it will haunt me for a very long time. This was fairly tame, compared to what I found next. Human trafficking, the cattle ranch. Cliché, I know. Everyone and their mothers has some story about human trafficking from the deep web. No, I don't have men come to my door to whisk me or my family away. However, I found a human cattle submission site. Now it is entirely possible that the site was fake and plastered onto the darker crack of the alley that in the internet is just for lols. But by no means am I here to tell you that everything I saw was 100% real life sites with bogeymen up to no good. But as far as creep factor, it was pretty high. Someone was sick enough in their heads to make the site and pay to keep it. 
Now upon clicking the link, you are brought to a large red flashing 1999-esque text reading, Welcome to the Ranch. And just below you could browse the cattle. Images of women looking from ages 16 to 45 with brief descriptions of what they were used for. They only had their first names displayed, and besides the name was voluntary or involuntary. The descriptions were volatile, explaining that specific women were used for breeding and meat or play. The meat was to be pre-cut to your specifications, packaged discreetly and mailed to you within two business days. Those determined for breeding were given ages, how many children they'd had thus far, and brief stories on their life before the ranch. The descriptions even went so far to say who gave them to the ranch, if they were listed as involuntary. Many were donated by husbands, boyfriends, and families looking for money, revenge, or some other unexplained reason. And lastly, those given up for play. I have a strong stomach, but the descriptions of this made me wretch a bit. These people were to be sent to the ranch to learn how to be pets. These women had no available names. All of them were marked as involuntary, and each had a description of what the donor wanted done to them. Graphic descriptions of sexual assault physical tortures and amputations. When the women eventually died, the page listed what they would be expect to be done with the corpses. It didn't end there. At the very bottom of the page was a link to a PDF file that could be printed and mailed or submitted online. The form was for donation of cattle. On it, you could list why the person was there, the basic health of the person, voluntary or involuntary, and who you were to the person, and additional notes if you had any. The owner of the page proudly left his or her own note that all cattle was discreet and they dealt primarily using Bitcoin and PayPal. Refunds were prohibited and ended on a cheerful note of enjoy your meal. I don't know the validity of this site, but it made for an interesting find. This adventure led to the contemporary death of my old Dell dinosaur. It was about a cannibal cult. This is my final entry. I don't know if this cult is exactly cannibalistic, but they alluded to it. I got interested in a creepy pasta story called useless.avi. It was pretty popular back when creepypasta was still a big thing. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, useless.avi was supposed to be a video of a woman, naked, tied to a bed and left alone with a chimp that was emaciated and abused. As one would expect, the chimp graphically moors and eats her. The video cuts to a naked man in a mask, licking a toilet, and then blackness. The video cuts. I had heard a lot of rumours about the video and decided to look into it. Being in high school and working part time, I had a lot of free time over breaks. In the evenings, I visited forums and chats dedicated to debunking creepypasta, and it all pointed to the video being fake, until I came across a thread titled, How Useless Can You Be? I don't remember what site it was on. I pretty much just randomly clicked and crossed my fingers. Anyhow, a user mentioned seeing the video before it was removed on the site, and had saved it. Too good to be true? Yeah, it was a hoax account, but it luckily prompted an active member of this cult to post. And post he did. He had created a web page for the cult he called Revision of Humanity or something to that extent. On it, he had many videos created by the group meant to be art installations to provoke thought regarding human behavior. The cult had simple origins, 
and were self-proclaimed freedom thinkers, out to wreck the US government. However, they took a dark turn when a member wanted to leave, leading to useless.avi, or at least a rough interpretation of it. The poster had the useless video amongst many other short videos. They were all fake, and the members acted as actors, except in useless. The woman in useless was a member that wanted to leave. The chimp was a pet of the leader who failed to care for it, and lost his temper at it. The woman was truly killed in the video, and it was graphic, although extremely grainy. The poster made mention that the majority of the cult had disbanded after the woman's body was found, and the leader and ten members were tried and convicted for a slew of crimes including, but not limited to, murder, rape, petty theft, and animal neglect. The poster went on to say that he wanted to recreate the cult, and left on a message board that, if you do not understand, then you are part of the problem. Terminate yourself for salvation of the masses. I laughed it off as just another poser, and assumed it was a hoax until I went to exit my browser, and found that my screen had frozen. Fed up after five minutes, I resorted to holding down the power button. It would not shut off. I unplugged the damn thing, as it only had power when it was plugged in. The battery was crap and it didn't shut off. I plugged it back in and tried to exit using the escape key when the screen started violently flashing error messages, and then finally flashing black and white with the words, part of the problem, slathered all over my screen like sunscreen left on the hands of a toddler. The speaker started blaring static with chanting voices that I couldn't make out other than a low hum. My screen suddenly went blue, with what looked like random codes, and then shut off. I was unable to turn it on for almost two weeks. For a month after that, every time I tried to access a web page, the computer would redirect me to the cult page. After about a month, it all sort of stopped. Smart troll using a programmed virus? A genuine cult? I don't know. I don't concern myself with it much. It makes for an interesting story, even if it is boring to deep web standards. I need to buy myself off the deep web before somebody else does. I don't know how much time I have. I saw the offer hours ago. The only thing I can do now is tell you how I happened upon it myself. It's stupid, really. Really, really stupid. I was trying to impress my friends. We were all enrolled in IT class at our school. We would take turns, seeing who could bring up the most screwed up website. It started out by showing our friends websites on the deep web that people could buy drugs from. Drugs that we had never heard of. That got boring really quick. Other friends began upping their content to try and stand out in our game of I'm more tech savvy than you. They would bring more and more pictures, each more disturbing and gruesome than the last. Pictures of people dying, of people being tortured and unimaginable things. People that were already dead. One person brought up a very nefarious sight, PC. Instead of people saying exactly how screwed up this was, and how this should all stop, and how this should have never have begun in the first place, and how stupid it was, and how much danger we were all in, they congratulated her, gave her a pat on the back, and asked her how she could even sit down properly in a computer chair because of how big her balls were. I felt like puking. I felt like beating the ever-loving crap out of everybody, and I couldn't believe how screwed up it was to see all that disgusting stuff on the internet 
and see it as an accomplishment. I didn't say anything though. They began to notice that I never showed off anything myself. And I began to get a new nickname at school. School became a living hell for me. My friends began shoving these horrible pictures in my face whenever they could. When I cried and vomited, they claimed they were trying to desensitize me. Everything became too much though. I promised myself I wouldn't venture too deep. That I would only stay long enough to find something that would appease them. At this point, we were long past the point of finding cool drugs and stuff. I knew I had to find something that would hold importance. At this point, I had been on the deep web for three hours. Five hours was what it took to put an offer for me on the deep web. At one point, I remember opening a seemingly blank page. Immediately, the light next to my computer flashed, briefly. I minimized the browser to close photo booth, only to find that it wasn't open, and I didn't think anything of it. I was tired and had school the next day. So, bored, I closed everything down and went to sleep. The next few days went the same, until the last. When I walked in, everyone was huddled around one desk, talking in hushed voices. A few of the girls were crying, and all of them were pale and covered in sweat. I didn't want to see whatever had caused this reaction. Nobody noticed I'd walked in, until class had started. I caught several of them staring at me during the class. They had probably planned a new way to make me go home sobbing. I had tried to leave the class as quickly as I could, but one of them caught me by the shoulder and spun me around. We need to talk. His voice was quivering, and his clammy, trembling hands were soaking through my t-shirt. He led me to the back of the classroom, where other students in the same shape as him, or worse, were huddled. He began passing out pictures. When it was my turn, I told him that I didn't want to see whatever they had. No, you have to see this. Something about the way he said it told me that it was serious, and it wasn't just regular bullying. I cracked open one eye. I saw some girl on the paper, along with some sort of description and a price. I opened my eyes further, and saw that it was an ad of some sort. I thought, oh, this isn't that bad. It hadn't fully hit me yet, until I read what sort of description it was. Hi, it's me again, back with some more for you guys. This one looks fairly young, with a bit of extra weight on her. I don't know, I need to get more pictures. I think it was her first time here. She wasn't protected at all and it was easy enough, but enough about that. For now, her starting price is $118,000. We'll go up and down whenever we get more pictures and do the physical inspection. Anyway, we'll keep you updated. There was a picture of me, staring at my computer intently. I had no social media. The only pictures of me were the ones I had taken with a group and there were so many emotions swirling through me. One that stood above all was confusion. The crippling fear was lurking in the shadows for now. How had this person gotten this picture of me? My mind went back to the light next to my camera, and one question was answered. Next, the paralyzing fear set in. I felt my heart stop completely then beat violently in my throat and ears. My stomach dropped. My eyes searched furiously over the paper for any information about me. I felt relief at the fact that my full name, along with my address, weren't there. That all came crashing down, when I realised that the person who had posted the ad had these, but chose not to put them in the description in case anyone were to grab me without paying. I knew without a doubt that the others were going to be sold too. I passed out. 
I woke up in the nurse's office, who told me I had a fever, and my mother picked me up and took me home. I went straight into my room and locked the door. I haven't touched my PC ever since. I put tape over my phone camera, even though I know my efforts are futile. Everything I hear now is someone out to get me. The only sick thing that comforts me every now and then is that the people that made me do this are going to be sold quicker than me. I don't know what I was thinking really. I had been drinking with friends and got home drunk. I decided to open tall and one link led to another. I ended up on a marketplace website that was selling all sorts of shady stuff. I could buy my own weight in cocaine if I saw fit and had the money. Though something else caught my interest. A posting said, mystery box made to order, 250. I read the description, which listed what it could contain. A brand new iPad. That was it. That was the thing that made me send the $250 worth of Bitcoin to some random guy in some random place on the internet. I had vague memories of sloppy messaging to the seller, and I really wanted that iPad. Oh God, I remember sending them an extra 50 to sweeten the deal. What a moron. When I woke, my head hurt. I had a full blown migraine. It wasn't until I had breakfast, showered, and opened my laptop that I remembered. My heart sunk. I didn't have money to waste on shit like that, but I did. I clicked the button to message the seller to tell them I changed my mind, but nothing happened. I refreshed the page, and as you can imagine, the listing wasn't found. Now I didn't think myself to be an idiot. I wouldn't fall for some 411 scams. I know no Nigerian prince wants to send me money, but drunk me? He's a bit questionable. I checked my Bitcoin account to see it tell me that I was out of untraceable money. I swear I had at least 750 in there. If you take the exchange rate of the day, with the way it fluctuates, it may have been only $300. I was depressed for the rest of the day. I promised myself I wouldn't do anything like that again. But then drunk me is a real... Weeks passed, and I completely forgot about it, to be honest. And I didn't want to remember how stupid I had been. Today, though, I did remember. I walked downstairs to see a large brown box on the kitchen table, addressed to me. My dad must have received it from the mailman when he was getting ready for work. I stared at it, shocked to see that it had actually arrived. I picked it up. The weight was lopsided, but it was heavy. That was a good sign. At least it wasn't filled with packaging chips. I pulled off the tape and opened it up to reveal a lot of packaging chips. And I chuckled to myself before plunging my hand in. I pulled out an anonymous red sweater. I held it to my face. It smelt of perfume. It was used. I was slightly disgusted. But what did I expect from the dark web? I placed it on the table next to me. The next item was a set of keys. I examined them and wondered why on earth that was part of this parcel. It was literally like the guy just shoved some random things into a box and sent it. I was beginning to feel ripped off. I placed my hand in again and pulled out a small bag with a note attached. I knew what it was before I read it, and I was excited. A little thing to make the time pass more calmly, written in Sharpie. It was a good amount of weed. I'd never bought drugs off the internet, and I opened the bag to see it was the real deal, and that strong, smelly, skunky stuff rose up. I took a deep breath and sighed. I'd say it was about $70 worth, give or take and I pushed it into my back pocket, 
worried that my mom would be up any minute and catch me. I was intrigued to see what was remaining. Maybe I'd make my money back. The next item was a small wooden box. I opened it to see a few pieces of silver jewellery, and I checked each one, having no idea if it was worth anything. There were two necklaces and two rings. I wondered if these were stolen or bought from a pawn shop. I placed it next to the red top. The next was another baggie, with another note written in Sharpie. You'll need these, trust me, winky face. I was a little anxious when I read the note, and saw a small box of Xanax inside. Why did I need anxiety medication? I was not one to dabble in prescription drugs. Weed a little, and mushrooms was all I needed. I knew some friends who'd pay pretty good money for that. I had no idea how much they were worth, though. I looked it up later. I assumed $50, so that was about 130 so far. And to be fair, for something off the dark web, if I only lost around half my money, I should count myself lucky. I fished around in the box again, and couldn't feel anything else. I picked it up to feel if it was still heavy, and placed it down and stood up. I reached all the way to the bottom, and felt something large and slender. I pulled it out. It was an iPad. Holy crap. Jackpot. It was slightly scratched, but it wasn't first generation. It was light and thin, and it was at least an air. I was stoked. It was at that point that my mother popped her head around the corner. Hey honey, did you get a package? Yeah, I said. Suddenly aware I could smell the weed in my back pocket. Hey, you found my sweater, she said delighted. Where was it? Uh was all I mustered. She picked it up, and unconsciously the keys too. She walked away. I sighed, worried she'd smelled the drugs. What's that? She said, turning. I'm holding it for a friend, I said without thinking. What? She said, not paying attention. What's my jewellery box doing down here? I stared at my mum, slack-jawed. She picked it up and opened it, studying if anything was missing. Well, answer me, she demanded. It was in the package, I said honestly. Don't bullshit me. Were you going to sell this? No, I promise. Just wait until your dad gets home. Jesus, Darren. I swear, this is not your stuff. It was in my package. I bought it off the net. You expect me to believe you bought my exact top and jewellery box off the internet? Why in God's blazes would you do that? It was a mystery box. It could have contained anything. You come up with such garbage sometimes. I think it's best you go to your room. I'm 17, I said. When you're under our roof, it's our rules. I picked up the iPad and went upstairs. I laid on my bed and turned the device on. I was surprised to see it still had power. A few non-standard apps appeared on the desktop as I swiped one lock. Nothing of interest, though. I checked the email program to see that it was blank. I was worried it was stolen. I knew I couldn't keep it if there were any personal data there. I checked the Photos app. There were about a dozen. I tapped the first. It was a low-light shot of the street. Could have been anywhere. I swiped the next, and it was the front of a house. The light was on in the front room, but in the low light, it overexposed the shot and made it hard to see any detail. The next was the side of a house. The horizontal white wood sliding looked slightly similar to ours. The next was of what appeared to be a rear door, then one of a kitchen. I did a double take. The place looked identical to ours, then one of a living room. The TV bright, and hiding the faces of the people who sat on the couch and chair. Then one of the stairs. The brown waxed wood of the floor was uncanny, and my heart thumped in my chest. Then one of the landing. There was no coincidence. This was our house. 
The family portrait that hung on the far side wall, even in the low light, was obviously ours. I panicked, and didn't want to swipe again. But I did. My mother asleep on the bed. The bed covers, pulled. The next view, the covers being pulled apart gently. My mother pulled her legs from the sudden cool air. The cupboard open. A black gloved hand reaching out and searching. The hand holding a red sweater. A dark photo with lines of light obscuring the view. Another dark photo. This time the exposure was better, and I could see it from the inside of the cupboard. My dad was in the room. Then next, my dad is in bed next to my mother. Then one of the bed with my parents asleep. I swiped again and saw the covers pulled back. Whoever was doing this wanted to be caught. I was sure of it. After that, in the hallway again, the black gloved hand was holding the jewellery box outstretched. Only one photo remained, and it was above a bed with someone sleeping below. It was me. My blood ran ice cold. I threw the iPad to the floor and heard it cracking against the side of my desk. I leaped up and saw the screen stare back at me with a rainbow mosaic of broken LCD and glass. What was I going to tell my parents? They'd never believe me. I pulled the bag of pills out of my back pocket and read the note again. You'll need these. Trust me. I turned it over to read a date. 21st 07 2018 It must have been when the package was sent. I read it again and realised that it was tomorrow. Saturday. What does that mean? I have to warn my parents. If you don't hear back from me, call the authorities. I fear the worst. Have you ever found yourself in a position where you found yourself questioning everything you once believed to be true? Perhaps it was something political, or religious, or maybe you found out someone close to you was not as trustworthy or morally upstanding as you once thought. Maybe someone you loved turned out to be a monster. When I was in high school, my father started what he referred to as Project in our basement. He insisted that it was strictly for business, and he wanted everything down there to be kept strictly confidential. The basement would be off limits to everyone but himself. He even went so far as to having the basement walls soundproofed. I admit I found it strange that his job would demand such secrecy from him, but otherwise, I didn't give it any thought. Some of my friends at my high school were into all kinds of kinky videos or shock videos, like two girls, one cup. So it wasn't uncommon for them to spend time on obscure websites. I had never heard of these, but I spent very little time on the internet myself. Typically, just to look up NFL or NBA highlights. One particular day, we were sitting at the lunch table and my friends were talking about the usual bizarre stuff that they were into, describing it in disgusting detail. I was never interested, so I barely paid much attention. Then one of the guys, Kevin, began talking about something he described as the dark web, and what he described made all that stuff that he talked about before tame in comparison. Hitman sites, videos of animal cruelty and mutilation and torture. He even saw links to CP, although he denied clicking them. Kevin invited us all for a sleepover, at which he would show us some of the things he was talking about. We all agreed to come over, as he was navigating us through the dark web. I saw that he wasn't exaggerating anything. Every single horrific thing he described was present. He stumbled across a random untitled video link. What do you think? 
Should we watch? Everyone answered enthusiastically in the positive, although I was indifferent. With that, he clicked the link. The screen then changed to a very dark room, and for about 30 seconds, all we could hear would be the sound of heavy breathing. Finally, a small beam of light appeared, apparently from a flashlight, illuminating some guy wearing a strange mask, a top hat, and a suit and a cape. His voice was deeply distorted, so we couldn't recognise it. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. You may call me Hawkins, and boy do I have a show for you, he said with tremendous enthusiasm. Tonight, we have ourselves a trio of victims, and with that, the rest of the screen became illuminated. The room that they were in was small and cramped, and the walls were painted red. On the back wall, two women were locked up in wall-mounted cuffs. They were both completely nude, one of them overweight, and the other very fit. It was not some stereotypical dungeon in an old horror movie, but as I would soon discover, this was not a movie. Hawkins approached one of the female prisoners. Oh, you are one ugly thing. Things like you don't deserve to share this world with the pretty ones. He glanced over to the other woman, who was easily the more attractive one. Am I right? He said to her. She said nothing. I have something special planned for you. But for now, we deal with the ugly one. I stood there near my friends, worrying incessantly about what the man had on his mind. Garden shears, I heard Hawking say. With that, a second pair of hands appeared from our screen and handed the man a pair of garden shears. He slowly crept up to the woman. A pity. If only you were better looking, I might not have to do this. Without warning, he opened the shears and sliced off both of the woman's breasts, leading to a deafening scream from her and shocking gasps from me and my friends, one of whom began to vomit. Hawkins then went down to the woman's feet and tried to cut them off, but found it difficult as she had very thick ankles. No matter. Chainsaw. My heart sunk at the mention of a chainsaw. I heard him rev up the thing and slowly cut into the woman's ankles once again, leading to a more prolonged screaming and tears streaming down her face. Hawking's mask and costume became splattered in her blood, and after slicing off both of her ankles, he began cutting into her abdomen, leading to all sorts of blood and guts spewing all over the place. At that point, one of my friends passed out from the shock. I'll leave you to bleed to death. But as for you, he said, moving towards the second woman. Whip, Hawking said to his unseen assistant. He received the whip and walked up to the woman and proceeded to give her a number of brutal lashings. It was at this point where Kevin typed in the message box. What is your problem? The police will hear about this. Hawkins was about to unzip his pants when the assistant spoke up. Hey boss, check the message. Hawkins kicked the woman in the gut before coming over to the camera. Oh, a tough guy, eh? Gonna call the police on me, huh, Kevin? And with that, we all gasped in horror, as the crazy masked man mentioned my friend's name. No matter. I have all the information I need on you. Looks like I'll be seeing you soon enough. Now if you'll excuse me, I have business to attend to. It was here when Kevin shut off the computer. My other friends bailed, but I chose to stay with him the night even though I was equally scared out of my wits. Fortunately, nothing happened, but Kevin didn't get any sleep at all. A couple of weeks passed, and it appeared that what had taken place had blown over. 
until one Friday night. I was watching the news when I heard a report of a mass homicide nearby. I was horrified when I saw the reporter standing outside what I recognized as Kevin's house. Kevin was reported as missing while his parents and siblings were brutally murdered. My God, they got him. During the night, I woke up to use the restroom. As I walked out, I saw my father coming up the stairs, looking like he had just finished yard work as his clothing was covered in dirt. Dad, it's 1am, what are you doing? I asked. Fixing a busted sprinkler. A 1am? Why not? Is there some rule that says I can't? You said sarcastically. Whatever, Dad. I went back to bed and thought nothing of it. That was until next afternoon. My dad was out running some errands when I decided I was going to be a naughty little boy. I was going down to head into the basement to see what all the secrecy was about. I didn't usually have a rebellious streak, but after what had happened, I was definitely feeling curious as to what was down there. I flipped the light switch on and so far didn't see anything out of the ordinary. It didn't really look any different from the last time I saw it. Then I looked behind the staircase and noticed something which hadn't been there before. A door. My curiosity got the better of me. I opened the door and a light turned on automatically. What I saw caused me to freeze in terror. The door led to a room with red painted walls and wall mounted cufflinks just like the ones in the awful live stream weeks earlier. In a corner lay the blood-stained garden shears and a chainsaw as well as the whip. At the front of the room was a desk with a computer and a mask. The same strange mask worn by the man only known as Hawkins. I heard my father shouting and cussing upstairs as he saw the basement door open. He came down looking angry and stopped in his tracks when he saw me standing in the entry of his secret room and holding the mask. His expression changed from anger to shock as we stared at each other for the longest time. My father was arrested later that day. He had soundproofed the walls to prevent any possibility of anyone's screamings from being overheard by anyone in the house. Also, my friend Kevin and those two women were buried in our backyard, their bodies thoroughly dismembered and laid on top of one another. That would explain my father's late night yard work. I can't believe the man who raised me turned out to be such a vile monster. I always believed him to be a very principled and honourable man, but that is no longer the case. And now I am left to wonder whether or not he passed some kind of bad seed to me, and whether I will too one day snap and become the same kind of monster that he had become. When I was 12, I got into hacking, and I loved it. And I had gotten quite good at it. But my arrogance caused my unbecoming. You see, I was browsing some forum, and I came across something labelled as the dark web. I was overcome with curiosity, so I clicked on it. The post provided everything from what it was to how to access it. I, arrogant enough to think I wouldn't get caught, proceeded to download Tor Browser with no extra precautions and started browsing. All of a sudden, my laptop crashed and froze, and I got hundreds of pop-up warnings informing me I had a virus. Then it shut off. I stared in awe as it turned back on, only with a green light turned on where my camera was. Someone was watching. I got an anonymous message on Skype that read, You made the biggest mistake of your life. Who are you? I responded while panicking and covering my camera with my thumb. Your new friend. 
and with that the chat just suddenly disappeared. I formatted my laptop and made sure there was no remaining malware or viruses and had a quiet couple of days after that and was pretty relieved I thought I had defeated him. But sadly, I would come to know that wasn't the case. A week later, I was getting dressed in my room and was completely naked when I got a text on my phone that had no caller ID. It said, come closer. Who is this? The text didn't faze me yet though. I thought it was a wrong number or one of my friends prank calling me. Come closer. Closer to what? I wasn't sure what my friend was messaging me at this point. To the camera. Huh? What camera? Okay, which one of you a-holes did this? I was confused, but I had told my friends about the incident a couple of days ago, so other than the anxiety growing within me, I was consciously trying to convince myself it was a prank. Laptop. I walked over to my laptop still naked and saw the light of the camera wasn't on. I know you're either Joey or Zach. I put down my phone and got dressed and my phone started vibrating uncontrollably. I'd received 16 pictures of me, all naked. I screamed and ended up breaking my phone screen from the impact. I went off the grid completely. No social media or internet. That was it especially mortifying for a 12 year old girl. When I got back on later, I had no issues and warning signs and was relieved until almost four years later. I had gotten a new laptop and I was at my boyfriend's house. We were studying together when it turned into a makeout session. I heard my laptop ding many times and had gotten annoyed and turn around to see what it was. I guess I must have looked like a ghost because my boyfriend started panicking and shaking me. It was him. He's back. Or maybe he never left. I started rewinding of all the times I've been undressing with my laptop on, every time I've shared something private during a Skype call, and I started having a panic attack. His message read, don't forget to use protection. As if I couldn't smell the irony in that. He then continued to harass me for the next two years but it's been quiet for a year now. Until about four hours ago, I got a text that read, let me in. And then I heard a knock on my door. The door was locked and dead bolted. So there's no way I'm leaving my apartment. I'm safe in here. I called the police three hours ago and no one's shown up. I called again half hour ago, nothing. I called my boyfriend an hour ago and he said he's on his way but now he's just not answering his phone. Update. My boyfriend came over five minutes ago and when he saw me breaking down crying, he swore up and down he didn't get a call from me. And we went to the police station together and there was no record of my call. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to do. I have a story from the true dark net. Tor and protocols like it are an anonymity and plausible deniability source. Actual dark nets are kept well and truly hidden and cannot be found by any means available to the average channel. Trust me. Just one example out of maybe four or five that I have personally experienced with. Do take special note that this involves a great deal of luck. A friend of mine works at a small car insurance broker's office and asked me to fix a problem with his computer not recognizing the office scanner on his network. This is not related, just how I ended up there. I brought my laptop and I noticed a WEP wireless net with high signal strength. Out of curiosity, I turn on a sniffer to pick up the password while I enter the scanner. A few hours later, I'm leaving when I remember the sniffer. I got the password, connected, and poked around. So it's a basic home network. One system online with internet access. 
no firewall, apparently no antivirus, and for the hell of it, I drop in a back door before I leave. You never know what goodies you can run across. Well, I get home and start really digging through this computer. Just your average home computer. Most interesting stuff are some tax returns. There's a couple of text files that have what appear to be passwords, random characters, and a couple of names. Not much interesting, so I put my worm in it and leave it for maybe future use. Weeks later, I'm arranging some proxies for a few of my bots when I realize that there are four new bots I hadn't set up myself. What I figured later is that the owner of that WEP machine, my friend's boss, had taken a file from it on a floppy, which my worm happily infected, which then spread to a few more machines he used. This is where the interesting stuff began. Two of those machines had internet access, of course, but they had apparently never been used to actually access the internet. They both ran Windows 98, completely unpatched. They apparently had internet access only because they were physically networked with other machines that were used for internet access. Each one of these machines had about three terabytes of storage. Mostly appeared empty, but was actually packed nearly full of encrypted bytes. The stuff that was easily viewable included huge amounts of personal information, including SSNs and tax IDs, names, addresses and lists of families, friends, sometimes pets, and sometimes a lot of detail, such as vehicles, clothing, height, weight, recent medical issues, and huge amounts of information. Not every listing had all of it. Some were just names, and what they all had were dates. I couldn't make much sense of it, but what I could make sense of were the bank accounts. Thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of numbers, instructions, safety deposit boxes, all over the world. South Africa, Russia, Brazil, everywhere. Nothing but the basic identifying information, and another date, no note of what they might be. As I was picking through one of the two machines, I noticed a file being written. I figured someone was on the computer at that moment, but the only command events were coming from my worm. Nobody was using a mouse or keyboard, so then I figured it was an automated system process, and I watched what it was doing for a minute. Then I realized the computer was communicating on another network that wasn't a protocol I recognized. Because I knew when it started writing, and when it stopped, I was able to transcribe the entire file, which was about 78 megs. I assumed it was one file, and not a chunk of something else, and I was right. It was still encrypted, but it turned out to be fairly simple. Since it was one file, I had a few educated guesses about what a file size it was, and my first was right. It was a movie. MPEG format. The title was just random string. The video itself was an overhead view of three men sitting at a table. In the entire 15 minutes of the video, only one spoke. It sounded like gibberish. I figured it was code or he was nuts. He said things like, broken banana, stung red boot. He would pause and then say another strange sentence and kept on going for about 10 minutes. The other two just watched him. One was drinking what I assumed was coffee. Finally, he leaned back and asked if they would leave his daughter alone. The guy drinking the coffee just shook his head quickly and the talker started crying, really crying, hard. He leaned forward again and said another nonsense sentence and the video ended. Timestamp was about 20 minutes before the video was uploaded to the machine I got it from. I had a really weird feeling about it, but my best guess at the time was that it was some kind of clip from a movie I hadn't seen, and what I saw was a streaming broadcast. The timestamp on the file just being the time it was sent. In it, the man that had spoken the first one was crying like a baby, 
He had apparently done unspeakable things with what appeared to be the corpse of a young girl. With her throat cut and blood all over the table. The same one the three men had been sitting at in the first video. The other two men were still in the room, standing on either side of the room watching, smoking cigarettes. I didn't finish watching it. I only got about a minute or so in before it sank what I was seeing. I've seen a lot in my time. This was not a movie. I cleaned my traces from those systems and haven't looked back. What I'm still finding hard to believe is that from the computer I'd originally hacked, these other systems got infected by a floppy. As near as I can tell, the two storage computers were on opposite sides of the globe, one in LA and one in Beijing. The WEP computer I found in Dallas, and two of the other infected computers were in Winnipeg, as far as I know. My friend's boss had not left the country. His brother-in-law had been visiting at the time, though. I started doing it on a whim. My brother has an unhealthy obsession with online vloggers. I can barely go a day without him linking me to a video of someone taking part in some sort of challenge or performing some social experiment. So when the whole deep web mystery box trend started, I was one of the first to know. My brother must have sent me dozens of videos of annoying preteens opening up boxes filled with junk that they tried to pass off as creepy and sinister. When my brother asked me for my opinion, I told him that it combined all the boredom of an unboxing video with all the stupidity of the Tide Pod challenge. I added, that most of them were probably making the boxes themselves. Even I could do it. And that's when the wheels started turning. A quick search confirmed that this was a growing trend, with hundreds of people claiming to have opened up boxes containing everything, from drugs to murder weapons to mysterious flash drives. Some vloggers even claimed that they had spent thousands of dollars on a single mystery box. Those were obviously fake. But what about the rest? Were there really people out there who would spend at least a hundred dollars for the chance to go viral? I bet they would. And unfortunately I was right. Putting the boxes together was easier than expected. I had some cardboard boxes stuffed in my closet that turned out to be the perfect size for the job. Some rusty screwdrivers proved perfect as my murder weapons. My desk drawer offered a surplus of random old flash drives that I made mystery box ready by filling them with many creepy videos, which I downloaded. Finally, some expired sinus tablets provided me with some mysterious deep web drugs, once I had peeled off the labels. Getting the website set up on the deep web was a little harder, but you can find an online tutorial for anything these days. By the time I was ready to go to bed, I was the proud owner of the Emporium of Mysteries. For $50 worth of Bitcoin, anyone could be the proud owner of a mystery box. Sure, the site looked like it had come straight out of the early 90s, but it was good enough. I was in business. The next morning, I went looking for customers. Fortunately, my brother's messages had made me very familiar with the online vlogging community, and I messaged a few of the smaller channels with some burner accounts that I made, and left a few comments on the latest videos. You should do a deep web unboxing video. You know what would be really cool? Unboxing something from the deep web. I bet you'd get millions of views. I heard about this new place on the deep web called Emporium of Mysteries. They sell mystery boxes there. You should check them out. Then all I had to do was to sit back and wait. By the end of the day, I had six purchases. Not much all put together, but enough to help put food on the table. By the end of the afternoon, I had the boxes ready to ship. I wasn't looking to scam these people after all. They all got to make their stupid videos, and I got to eat. Everyone was happy. I sold a few more over the next few weeks, but eventually interest died down. Life went on, 
and my brother sent me more stupid videos, and I gradually forgot about my time as a deep web merchant. Until last Friday. When I got home from work, there was a package waiting for me outside my apartment door. When I picked it up and examined it, I realised it was one of my mystery boxes. It looked like I had an unhappy customer, but it wasn't like they were getting their money back. I took it inside and opened it up. It was empty, save for a flash drive that I did not recognise. I was curious what was on it, but I wasn't about to let some disgruntled hacker infect my computer. So I dug out an old laptop that I hardly used anymore, and plugged it in. It was full of pictures. Pictures of my hometown. Of my apartment. Of me. Whoever sent me this had been following me, had been inside my home, and staring at those pictures, I started to realise just how out of my depth I was. You see, not everything you find on the deep web is fake. There are some people out there who do sell real mystery boxes, and they are tired of scammers like me taking away from their profits. Thankfully, they are also very generous people and want to give me a second chance. So I'm pleased to announce the Emporium of Mysteries is under new management. Now, for the same low price, you will receive a genuine mystery box. It will include a special tool from my new partner's personal collection, along with a video instructing you of how to use it, co-starring myself. The body part or organ extracted during the video will also be included as a special memento. Supplies are limited, so search us on the deep web as soon as possible. We look forward to your business. The dark web ruined my life. I only went on because I knew my uncle used to. He's really good with computers, so I guess I got my skill with technology from him. I'm not going to say how I got on there, because I don't want to make it easier for others to make the same mistake I did. Anyway, after a little while of looking around, I found a link titled Hypnotising Scenery. I don't know what compelled me to click on it. I hadn't planned to click on anything at all. I just wanted to look around a bit, to soothe my curiosity. I suppose. When I clicked on it though, well, it was weird. At first it was just a bunch of normal scenery. Pictures of mountains, old castles, oceans, normal stuff. Then the pictures started changing faster and faster. I couldn't even make it out what the pictures were anymore. I saw a lot of red, maybe blood, on clothes or a mattress. I'm not sure, but it also looked like there were words over the pictures. I couldn't read what they said, but in time the picture switched again. Suddenly, it ended with a blank screen, with white text that read, Good luck. I feel like I should mention that this was all about 30 seconds. After it ended, I shut everything down and went to bed. The next morning when I woke up, I had this horrible migraine. It just wouldn't go away. When I went to school, everyone seemed so loud and annoying. This one kid, Anthony in particular, was driving me insane. He kept poking me with his pencil, as he did every day. I'd tell him to stop, but he would just laugh. As he did this, I kept thinking about how great it would be if I could just rip his arm out of his socket, maybe poke him with the pencil in the throat, see how he liked it. I had decided. The next time he poked me, I would kill him. One, two, three, four, poke. I snapped my head around, got up, and ripped the pencil from his hand so hard, he fell out of his chair. I got on top of him and held the pencil to his throat, pressing harder and harder. He was grasping at my arms, trying to get me off him, but I felt stronger than ever. He couldn't manage to push me off, as the trickle of blood began to run down the side of his neck. That's when the principal, vice-principal, and three janitors managed to pull me off. 
Suddenly, I heard all the screaming and commotion. All 35 students crowded against the walls in the corner, with the teacher gasping for air, crying and backing up against her desk. My parents came and collected me 20 minutes later. The cops were never called, and I guess the kids' parents decided to not call them and press charges. I'm not sure why. I would have. I was expelled from school, however, and my parents were pretty angry. I didn't know what came over me. But as I had that pencil against his throat, all I could think about was how great I felt. Invincible. Powerful. Now, I just feel like the same 16 year old. Five foot three, 120 pound small girl I was the day before. And my migraine was back. Great. I remember that it had started to fade away as I tackled Anthony. I tried to get to sleep but all I could think about was how he got away. I wanted him dead, bloody on the ground and gasping for breath. I wanted to end him. I wanted to be the last thing he saw before he died. I couldn't believe I was thinking this way. I was never violent before, but now it was all I could think about. I didn't care who it was, I just wanted to kill someone, not just kill them, but torture them. I decided to go back to the page to see if I could find some answers. It was that link that did this to me, turned me into some kind of monster. There it was, hypnotizing scenery. This time when I clicked on it though, it was a list, a set of rules. Number one, Always finish the kill. If you don't, the migraine will worsen quickly and you'll be dead in four months. Number two, take it slow. Don't finish it off too soon or the migraine will return faster. Number three, don't be stupid. Don't get caught. And number four, leave the mark. Something for them to remember me. A small J carved into their forehead. Number five, you are my creation. I have made you to continue my legacy. Don't fight it. It's not worth it. I'm now 26 years old and have killed a countless number of people. Anthony was my first official kill, only three months after the incident, when I couldn't handle the migraines anymore. I don't think that I'm me anymore. My creator will probably see this and might end me but I wanted to write this as a warning before the monster takes over again. Don't go on the dark web. It isn't worth it. I work for a huge company that helps bring down bad websites on the web. I cannot reveal the name here, but I have been doing this for many years now. A few years ago, I discovered a group of red rooms called the Five true red rooms on the deep web. Now, don't go lurking around trying to find them because you won't. A true red room cannot be accessed through Tor. If you try, you will just set yourself up for getting a shitty virus on your computer. I have been told that they are scams, but rest assured, a few of them are not. It is very hard for an individual who doesn't understand the concept of the five true red rooms to try and break in. Let's just say you have to know someone that runs one of them. It cannot be accessed through Tor. You have to know or be lucky enough to get a passcode to be let in. You have to be proven trustworthy. In this case, I gained the trust of someone who helped moderate one. The true red rooms are a series of five rooms, sort of like doors. If you can gain access to the first red room, you pay Bitcoin and show that you are serious and you may get permission to access the second room and so on. What's in these evil live streams? I'll tell you. Here's the first true red room. I clicked on the first screen. A black box appeared asking for my passcode. I typed it in. It was four numbers and a dash in my username 
and was giving me access to the site. Permission granted, it said. I was in. I thought it was too easy. On the first page were a bunch of black video boxes with titles. Some of them were videos titled Watch Me Scare Kara or Tiffany Gets Spooked. I clicked on the Watch Me Scare Kara first. A man with what seemed to be a cell phone camera is pointing it towards the front door. He is inside a home. It looks like he is hiding behind a door and I can see the living room furniture. A nice leather love seat, and bookshelves are in the room. He is whispering in a foreign language that I cannot understand. He never shows his face. Suddenly the doorknob is turning and I hear keys rattling. A girl in a green nurse's uniform with blonde hair and tan comes in. She is petite looking. She is probably in her twenties. Suddenly, I hear a man's voice scream. Don't move. She froze like a deer in headlights, and then screams and drops her keys. A man in all black and a black ski mask is running towards her with a giant hammer. Her arms go up. She screams to block him, and he smacks her in the head twice with the hammer. She falls to the ground, and blood pours on the white carpet. She's completely knocked out. The man points to the man who is hiding behind the door and says what sounds like the word, Doan. Both cameras are shut off. If this was real, it was the most disturbing thing I'd ever seen. It did not look fake at all. I didn't know what happened next. I could only imagine. I didn't even want to click on the second video, but I did. The next video is called Tiffany Gets Spooked. It was even worse. This time the camera zoomed in on what looked to be a park. A woman with brown hair and blue jogging suit is running laps around a track. The foreign sounding guy is sitting in what appears to be his car and I can see the cracked windshield. He is wearing black gloves but never shows his face. He is laughing and talking a little, and the girl is still jogging. I wanted to yell for the poor girl to run away and to get out of the park. Then I realized there was nothing I could do. She wouldn't be able to hear me. Suddenly the camera shuts off. I think the video is over, but I was wrong, very wrong. The video comes back on what looks like night vision. It is green and a little choppy. I can see what looks like a bunch of pine trees around. Then I see what the camera is focusing on. A girl is in what looks like a trunk and she is trying to scream. Her legs and arms are tied and bound and her mouth has a gag in it. It looks like the same girl from earlier in the blue jogging suit. She is barefoot. I can only see the black gloves and a hairy looking arm. It looks like the same guy from the earlier video. He is in all black and is gently brushing her black hair. And the man holding the camera is telling her to calm down in English. She is crying. Then he begins to pull her body out the trunk. Thunk. He bumps her head by accident on the trunk lid. I feel relieved thinking it's all a joke and that she will be okay. Suddenly I feel sickened. I can't believe what they're about to do. The man in black with the ski mask lays her on the ground and she gives up crying and starts screaming. The camera zooms in on her face. The lights go out on her and all I can see is darkness. The poor girl has lost all hope. I want to cry and I fight back tears. They began to tie her wrist to the bumper of the car. The cameraman is still there holding the camera. The other man gets the car. I hear the engine roar. They were going to drag her behind it. And with that, the video cuts off. It's not a very debatable topic when people say that the internet has infiltrated practically every aspect of human life. The internet is everywhere. 
zooming around us, passing through us, teaching us, and more interestingly enough, changing us as beings. Astral projection has been a part of human culture and mythology ever since humans first began living on planet Earth. Different ancient cultures have drawn different pictures of aliens and UFOs on cave walls and all over the planet, independent of each other's stories and myths. Recent developments in certain areas of fringe science tell us that it's possible that alien abductions and astral projection are inseparable experiences. That alien abduction is only possible through an altered state of consciousness, like astral projection. Although most people nowadays, due to the internet, know at least something about what astral projection is. It is still clouded within myth and confusion. How have humans from indigenous tribes to iPad addicted first graders experienced this phenomenon without hearing stories of it previously? It is very hard to deny that astral projection is anything less than a very real and natural experience. In 1968, Charles T. Tart did an experiment on a woman who claimed to have an out-of-body experience every night when she slept. Over a period of four nights, he conducted this experiment and found that during astral projection sessions, the participant reported leaving her body, floating above her bed, and being able to read a five-digit number placed overhead out of her sight. The five-digit number matched the one written down by the psychologist. Although this experiment had been picked apart many times, it is still fairly conclusive based on the results of the experiment that an out-of-body experience could very well be the cause if ruling out telepathy. Astral projection has been conducted many times, almost all with shocking and seemingly conclusive results. Like many metaphysical topics, however, it is hard to prove anything completely. But I don't have to rely on these experiments, because I experience out-of-body phenomenons fairly often. Now, Back to the interwebs. Astral projection is when you lay in your bed and your soul or astral body leaves your physical body and is able to explore the world free from physical restraints. You could see the Great Wall of China, check on your boyfriend or girlfriend to see if they're cheating on you and accidentally catch your best friend masturbating when she thinks that no one is watching. Kind of creepy, right? And anyone can do it at any time. With all of these things you can do, it seems like no one in their right mind would waste such potential for fun by spending their out-of-body experience surfing the internet. But that's what I did. And that is what my story is about. I woke up in the night with a tingly feeling over my body and a loud humming in my ears. I felt alert and awake and full of energy. Without thinking, I got up and went to my computer. But my computer wasn't my laptop. It was an old monitor with a rounded glass screen. I realised now that it was the archetype of the computer. I guess the collective unconscious of people visualise a computer as an old Windows machine. I looked back at my bed. And yes, like I thought, I was astral projecting because I touched the mouse and the screen lit up, revealing an old, cluttered desktop with a green background. The OS looked like a mix of Windows and Mac OS, which I thought was very cool. During astral projection, you are fully conscious, and some report the dream to be even more vivid than real life. Usually, everything isn't the same as the real world. Experts in the field believe the astral realm exists all around us as a kind of fourth dimension. Invisible, yet very real, existing as an energetic copy of everything in our world. There were strange programs on the desktop, 
Some looked like old prototypes of programs like Microsoft Word or GarageBand. Some of the icons that had never been designed showed a small square photo with a skull and small blocky words underneath it that said, no icon. I clicked on the Internet Explorer one and a black box popped up and displayed a white loading bar. Do you remember going on the internet on phones before smartphones were around? And how all the pages were simplified into blocks of text and images? That's what this looked like. An old cell phone's internet rendering skills. The tail of the mouse pointer dragged for a very long time, leaving a slow streak of white flowing every moment. It seemed like everything in the computer was being played in blurry slow motion and looked very eerie. Everything was black, green and grey. I clicked on the search bar and a list of popular websites came up. I clicked Google and it took me to the page. But the word Google wasn't in colourful letters. It was just black Helvetica that said Google very plainly. I clicked on the search bar and it flashed black and nothing happened. I tried to type and no letters appeared. So I went to the above search bar and tried to type again. Nothing happened. So I guess you can't type anything in Astral Google. It kind of blocks you for some reason. I looked at the list of popular sites and clicked one that said HTTPS dot slash slash graveyard twitter dot com. It took me to a page that looked like Twitter, but there were no background images and the bird in the upper corner looked like an emoticon bird and everything was typed in white blocky text against a black background. I saw a list of celebrity usernames and then to the right, shockingly enough, my username. I clicked it and it brought me to my Twitter page, but my profile photo was a very low resolution image of an eye. Very strange, very creepy. The eye was looking straight at me. I scrolled down the page and recognised every tweet, but none that I'd actually ever tweeted. Then I realised each tweet was something that I had meant to tweet about, but forgot or then decided against it. Somehow, it had been sent here. I clicked on my photos and blurred grey dot gif images, labelled with pixelated numbers. Each one was geolocated to the place I had posted it, even though I always make sure geolocation is disabled on my phone and computer. I randomly clicked another link and was reminded of the No Sleep Shadow Web story, because what it displayed was a pixelated video of someone making cuts on their arms with a knife, and beneath the video people were typing things like, deeper, cut the vein and just end it. I felt sick and scared, and I went to click the X button, but my mouse glitched and made me click the next cam button below it. What I saw still freaked me out. I saw a man's wrist tied up to a chair, palms down. The camera was right up to the man's hand, and another person was using needle nose pliers to rip and pull the man's fingernails off. A loud screaming sound suddenly boomed out the computer's outdated speaker system, making my ears hurt and my heart leap into my throat. My blood pressure was sky high and the man on the screen continued to pull the fingernails back. What I make of this is that the shadow web being such a dark place had made a permanent mark on the internet's archetype and exists there. And freaks who can astral project go to view it in their sleep. I pressed the print screen button and copied it to the paint program and printed it out. I was thinking that this won't actually print and not in the real world. I was thinking that I had to show this to the police I was too freaked out to think about how logical this was. The printer did its thing, and I went to press the monitor power button to try and wake up from this. 
but then I saw a folder on the desktop labelled Humanity. Its icon looked different to the others, newer. I clicked on it, and found many folders with names. It was almost like it had named everyone ever born. I clicked the first letters of my name on the keyboard, but the screen flashed black, like it did before. So I scrolled down until I hit my name. There are about 20 entries. So I expanded the date created tab and found the one with my birth date on it. I clicked on it. It wouldn't open. No matter what I did, it wouldn't. And the screen just flashed black every time I did. So I decided to look at my grandpa's folder. He had died years before. So I scrolled down and found him. And as soon as his folder opened, a video of him popped up on the screen and he was crying and shaking and yelling. The sound from the speakers was terrifying. It sounded like a mix between a computer glitching out, an air horn and a human screaming. I couldn't have exited the tab fast enough. I sat there crying and shaking, wondering why that happened. I soon got up the nerve and clicked on another random person's folder. All it showed was a picture, as if taken from their webcam, of them calmly surfing the web. In the folder there was a text file, and when I opened it it had info about them, where they were born, and when, and under death, there was nothing. I decided to see what would happen if I clicked on someone else who was already dead. So I put in Albert Einstein's name, and immediately, a video of Albert Einstein himself, screaming and shaking violently with his eyes bulging out of his head and his mouth wide open came up. I closed it quietly and realised that everyone who was dead had a dot .mov file in their folder instead of a picture. For some reason, an image I had seen on Tumblr popped in my mind. It was a picture that said, What would the world look like if we could see internet and radio transmission waves? or something like that, and there was grey fuzz lines through everything, and somehow I made the connection that because of the waves from Wi-Fi and radio and cell phones, when we die, they surround and torture us because they penetrate the astral world as well as the physical one. I turned off the monitor and buried my head in my hands and told myself to wake up, and suddenly I did in my own bed. It was about three in the morning. I was shaking all over, and my mouth had that all too familiar watery feeling taste, and I immediately vomited all over my blankets. I was scared walking through my house. I felt like something was there with me, and everything I saw was racing through my head. I didn't sleep at night, and the buzzing and screaming sounds were all I could hear. The thing that horrifies me the most is that the next morning I saw a piece of paper face down in the printer. I picked it up. It was the photo I printed, only completely grey with faint lines running through it, and my laptop computer was extremely hot. I truly believe in astral projection now, and ever since I've been researching it like crazy. Most of the time I'm too afraid to sleep because I don't want to astral project again. I don't know what caused me to think that radio waves and Wi-Fi can actually torment our souls when we die. But every time I see a cell phone, I imagine data waves floating out of it. And what if it's true? Why would everyone who had died been screaming? With everything good the internet has brought us, I keep thinking, what if there's something darker about it? Something evil? about it on the metaphysical level. What if humans were never meant to get this far technologically? What if we were never meant to get this advanced? I never want to astral project again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. An hour and 45 minutes raw audio. I was very impressed. I hope I delivered when I said that this video would be extra long, as I know a lot of you really like the deep web videos, 
So it would mean a lot to me if you would drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. Don't forget that I should be posting every night, so be sure to subscribe and hit the little bell icon to be up to date every time I post, and that way you don't miss your nightly spooks. If there is a story that you wish to share, like one of the submitted ones here, feel free to send it to my email address, or alternatively, drop it into my Reddit. Either are fine. Just be sure to include plenty of paragraphing and punctuation when it comes to submitting your story. But anyway, for now guys, I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.